Welcome back to the education track of Pike Online 2021. And I am joined by the fabulous Tom Kuntz. And he's going to be telling us about 10 tips for teaching technical topics, uh, which will be a fantastic talk. Um, I've never felt quite uh, so lacking in a pop filter as I do right now. Um, uh, Tom, a quick introduction to Tom. He's been teaching programming professionally for four years at the University of New South Wales. He's a course administrator for Comp 1511, the Programming Fundamentals course in UNSW's School of Computer Science. Uh, in that course, he's taught more than 200 students uh, of varying program abilities, the C language, so I can ask him all about C and Python and all of that stuff later in the questions. Yes, this is a subtle plug to write your questions in the question. Um, uh, but outside of teaching, Tom's an avid Python programmer, having worked, pro worked professionally as a Python software development developer uh, and using it to make tools for teaching uh, as user-friendly debugging systems and assignment marking and all sorts of things. Um, now, I have threatened an outrageous amount of interpretive dance, um, but rather than, <laughs> rather than fulfill that promise slash threat now, I'm going to leave you with Tom uh, for this fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here. So yeah, my talk is 10 tips for teaching technical topics with Tom, because I thought that a bit of alliteration in the afternoon would be acceptable. Um, so what do I want to get out of this talk? Let's uh, go to the first slide. There we go. Um, which is, I have sort of three aims for three different groups of people. If you're new to teaching coding, I'm hoping that this will just be a bunch of tips that will help you um, this talk was originally written for new tutors at the School of Computer Science at UNSW. Um, so the hope was, you know, just giving people tips that are useful. But I realized coming to a conference like PyCon, we're in the education track. Um, some of you may also already be very experienced teachers, in which case I hope what this talk gives you is easier ways to communicate what are important things about teaching programming to other people, and maybe as a sort of reference or something like that, that other people can use. And then even if you're not a teacher at all, I still think that this talk is useful because anything that you're doing in involving technology is really communication. And hopefully some of these tips will help you do things like bring on a new hire at work or work on um, any, sort, uh, any sort of project um, and, and communicate during that project. So let's go through. Uh, my first tip is just a really simple one, which is like, what is it to be a teacher? Um, I think that teaching breaks down into two different parts. The first part is transferring a mental model from your head into another person's head. And the second part is figuring out where somebody else's mental model diverges from yours. But your question might be, what's a mental model? It's a way of explaining the world. So for instance, you might think of a variable and say, well, a variable is just a thing inside of a box that you can change out. It's got a name that you can refer to. And that's going to explain how Python or any other language works as far as it goes. Now, obviously, if you're then going into the internals of Python and you're making some you know, deep changes to the semantics of things, that might not be enough. But the idea is it's an appropriate level of understanding that will explain the behaviors that you see. And so my thesis is that probably for the first 10 minutes of when you're teaching something, what you're doing is you're trying to construct a mental model and transfer it to somebody else. But unfortunately, the process from going from your brain to your mouth to the other person's ears and then into their brain is a lossy one. And so I've had this image here of just like the sort of compare the pair almost between two different uh, images. And you can see there are all these little changes. And so most of our work as teachers, in my experience, is finding those little differences and bringing them to light and explaining them away so that you and your student eventually end up with the same model of how the world works. I've got a few examples here of what that looks like. So the first one is an exercise that we do in Comp 1511 in our very first week. And I think this works for, for any, any uh, programming language. What we ask people to do is to make a peanut, well, give instructions to their tutor to make a peanut butter sandwich. You might think this has nothing to do with programming at all. But the idea is, by asking students to make a uh, peanut butter sandwich just with instructions, and then by really messing up their instructions, so you know they'll tell you to get a piece of bread and you'll just like grab a whole loaf or something like that, you, you teach them this idea that your know, programming has very specific instructions, that there is, you know, you need to be precise in what you're doing. And also that you need to break things down into smaller steps. And we're giving them a taste of that frustration that I'm sure we've all felt of, you know, I'm trying to teach this thing, uh, teach this computer how to do what I want, but I'm trying to communicate it in a way that it doesn't understand. So this is an exercise that is one way of transferring a mental model from your brain to your student's brain. 
Um, but then a little bit later on in the course, another example that we might have uh, is this piece of Python code. So we teach in C, but uh, I'll give my examples in Python. Here is an example of having two variables, one set to one, and the other one is set to an input string. And so you know, students will try and add those two things together and they'll say, why can't I add one plus three? And so here, their understanding of variables is perfect. Their understanding of printing is perfect. But clearly what they don't understand here is that adding a, str a string and an integer isn't possible. Or maybe it's, you know, they don't understand the difference between integers and strings and then there's actually a distinction there. And so a lot of our job then will be finding out that place where their understanding differs and giving them a good mental model of why the world works the way that it works to make this error, not only to fix this error, but to make it make sense. And so the first tip here is just, um, always ask yourself, what is different about the person's mental model to yours? Or alternatively, like what mental model do you want to communicate to them? So that's tip number one, nine more tips to go. Uh, but I'll, I'll mention as well, practically, try not to just be a code fixer. When you're giving, um, when, when you're helping a student, you don't just want to like go in and fix the code that's there. You actually want to understand why they thought that that code was correct and to make it better and to make their understanding better as well. Um, so tip number two is then creating an environment for learning. So if we're all agreed that the, the important thing here is uh, you know, un, uh, creating a mental model and transferring it to someone else, that's not going to work if you're not in an, in an environment where you can actually learn. And so there's this great idea of psychological safety. Uh, and Google's Teams study, which was a study they did of different high performing teams, said that psychological safety was the number one thing for high performance. And it's just as important in education. So what is psychological safety? Here's like a textbook definition, but really what it means is just that feeling when you're with people and you know that it's okay to mess up. You can make a mistake and that's not a problem. You're not gonna get judged for it. You're not gonna feel belittled and your peers aren't gonna you know, ridicule you in some way. And so um, this, this is a concept that's, that's so important in teaching because if you don't have psychological safety, somebody's not gonna show you the reasons why they didn't understand something. They're not gonna let you into their problems and, and allow you to correct the misunderstandings that have grown into this incorrect program that they've shown you. Um, so here's an example of this maybe. So you know, a, a student gives you a program where my number equals two and you're saying, well, if my number is, is less than zero, print out positive. This program is supposed to print out positive if it's a positive number, but it's only printing out negative numbers as positive, I believe. So, you know, if a student came to you with this code, I'm hoping most people here wouldn't say, you know, well, this is just an incorrect program. Here's how you fix it. What's probably better is to say, well, this, this is a great program. It's doing almost exactly what you want. And if you changed positive to negative, it would work perfectly. And hopefully students will almost by themselves figure out, you know, okay, so maybe I've gotten the, the positioning of the, of the um, less than sign wrong or something like that. And so if you work through this example, you, you don't just say, no, this is wrong, but you, you know, make them feel like they've gotten somewhere and they've just got a little bit further to go. That's when you're going to get that sort of psychologically safe feeling. And that's when you're going to be able to get that student uh, to learn something. So again, tip number two here is um, uh, practically is, is just that sort of psychological safety. But I think another way of talking about it is that like students remember the way that they feel. So it's not just about, you know, exactly what you're doing and what you're teaching them, but it's also about uh, the feeling that they come away with. You know, if you remember your best teachers, they're almost certainly the ones who you felt comfortable with them, who you could bring your problems to them. It's not just, you know, that they taught you calculus well. Um, and so as a practical sort of uh, corollary from that, basically just never say no. Uh, that's, a, that's a rule that we pretty much teach most of our tutors at, uh, at UNSW is you don't just say no to something, don't just say that this incorrect. You can almost always find a way in which this is the correct answer to a slightly different problem that if you just make a slight shift in how you understand things, it's all gonna become clear. So that's tip number two. Tip number three is, well, okay, we've created a psychologically safe space and we've also understood that you know, our, our job is to transfer a mental model. So how do you actually find the mental model? And to me, this requires sort of three steps. The first thing is you're never gonna find a mental model without interacting with the student in some way. So you don't just wanna look at their code and make a guess as to what went wrong. You probably wanna have a chat with them as well and say, okay, so uh, you know, wh why, is this, uh, why did this error come up? What were you trying to do? All those sorts of questions. When you're chatting with them, I recommend starting two steps back from wherever you actually uh, whatever question they asked you. So maybe they're asking you a question about this if statement, start and ask, you know, why are you asking me about this if statement or what are you trying to achieve? And like I said, pretty much all of this is gonna be asking them questions. Even though they've asked you a question, um, you know, trying to understand the rationale behind the question and what they're, what they're trying to understand is how you're gonna find that mental model. And the biggest tip I can give here is beware of what's called the XY problem. 
So the XY problem is basically somebody wants to know one thing and they think that the way that they solve this problem is by understanding another thing. So they ask you about that other thing without asking you, without telling you the reason why they think that that's the right solution. And so the reason this is so problematic is because a student will come up to you and say, I'm trying to understand, let's say, how do I connect to the internet? And maybe you tell them, oh, you've got to go and install the requests library and do this thing and that thing. And they go off and about three hours later, they come back to you and they say, this really specific thing isn't working. And you look at their code and it's just nowhere close to what they wanted. Had you stopped and, set, and taken a step back and said, why do you want to connect to the internet? Maybe you'd find out, oh, they actually wanted to do this other thing. And really what they wanted was the answer to an entirely separate question. And so again, all of this is going back to finding what their mental model of the world is, finding the reasons why they're asking the questions that they're asking, and understanding, is that the right question to be asking? Uh, so here's another example again. Um, so here's a, here's a list with six numbers in it. They're, they're trying to print out five of those numbers. And maybe they've asked you, you know, why is that last five in my list not getting printed out? And the answer is, well, in this case, it's just because there's a five in that range statement. So they're going from zero up to five, but not including five. But this really, you, know, you, you could give them the answer, oh, five isn't getting printed out because the range statement's wrong, change the five to a six. But that's really not gonna give them the full answer that you want. If you ask them the question, okay, what are you trying to do? And they say, I'm trying to print out my numbers. Well, then you can say, okay, well, maybe there's a different way of doing it. Maybe instead of using for i in range, we could just use for number in my numbers. Or maybe you could do something even crazier and say, oh, maybe you just want to print out my numbers as a whole array. And so if you're asking these questions, you'll probably get a better answer to them and one that actually fixes their mental model or helps grow their mental model in a great way. Um, so yeah, the tip here is sort of try to start from two steps back and understand their mental model. And then practically, I would suggest before you answer a question, make sure it's the right question. Uh, and, and often that's going to involve asking questions before you actually answer a question. Cool. So now we understand, OK, we've got to understand a mental model. We've got to have a psychologically safe space. How do I actually communicate that, that, that message? How do I communicate the, the, the mental model? There are a bunch of tools that I'd suggest considering that you might have at your disposal. So things like you might start off with paper. You might use your hands as you're seeing I'm gesturing wildly, approximating interpretive dance. Uh, you might have models. You might have analogies. You might have cahoots. Uh, all of these different tools are different ways that you can communicate your message to somebody else. Um, even more simply than that, underneath the tools that you're using, you can often design the way in which you're asking questions uh, to make them advantageous to you. So for instance, you can use somebody's experience of maybe they understand how a shopping list works. And if you're trying to explain to them a list, if you ask your questions in terms of, well, how would this work on a shopping list? A whole category of problems that they're, you know, maybe they don't understand why like adding to a list works or something like that. That whole category of problems goes away if you're asking the questions in such a way that maybe it uses their own experience or it ties back to an analogy that they already understand. So when you're trying to get your me message across, both think about the actual tools that you've got, so things like cahoots or whiteboards, and also think about the way in which you're asking those questions. Those are both really important ways uh, of, of getting your message across. And so the tip here is you know, think about the methods that you're using to communicate. And why not learn some new ones as well? So one of the nice things I've seen today at, at PyCon is you know, different people talking about all these useful tools that people have. And so you can maybe experiment with these new tools as well to communicate better or to communicate differently. So my fifth tip here is something that uh, I think we often have to um, tell to newer tutors. And that is because they'll start off by watching another tutor or watching the person who taught them, they'll try and copy the style that that person has. And that's a great way to get started. If you're really not sure what you're, you know, how to teach, copying what someone else has done is a good way to just find your feet and get your confidence. But you don't need to teach like everybody else. Um, so there are different things that you can try. So maybe you can try, you know, making uh, good jokes or maybe you can try uh, you know, being, be, being serious, or maybe you can try being a little bit uh, sort of sarcastic. All of these different things with a different person might work really well. Similarly, I've known some lecturers who love using memes, some lecturers who love using little games, um, some people who just like draw a lot. And each of those, again, can work really well with a different lecturer. Um, how do you interact with students? If you can find tools like using your hands or using polls or using a, a chat, if there is one, all these sorts of things, again, are great ways of um, uh, having a style that you can experiment with, that you can change, and that you can maybe reach people better with. 
And so what I'd recommend here, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, is you know, ask yourself, what are the teachers that you've enjoyed done? Are there things that you've noticed helped you when you were learning and that maybe you can integrate into your own style more and more? For me, I know that there are certain phrases that I've heard throughout my uh, time teaching that I've sort of borrowed. So um, that one, one of my favorites is, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you try something once and it feels good, let's do it again. And so I love that phrase. And, I, you know, we'll talk about while loops and that's something I'll bring up or um, all these sorts of different jokes, maybe, or phrases or, or ways of explaining something. They're all great things that you can use to, to improve, your, uh, improve your style or just change your style. Um, yeah, so tip five is explore your style. Um, tip six is a really concrete one. And this is something that we definitely hammer in during tutor training never touch the keyboard. And so the reasoning behind this is that the moment that you are touching a student's keyboard or touching anybody's key keyboard, really, you're taking away from their opportunity to learn. And you can often cover up the fact that they're not understanding something by you convincing yourself that, oh, I'm explaining to them what I'm doing and I'm just touching the keyboard. Unfortunately, if they're not the ones doing the typing, now they can start thinking about, oh, what's for dinner? Or I'm you know, thinking about another course or whatever. Whereas if they're the ones having to type, they're actually in the moment, they're having to understand what you're saying. They're at least understanding, you know, there are keys that I'm pressing and maybe they're getting something out of that. But it means that they're in the mo in the moment. They're, they're actually with you and they're listening to you. So absolutely a, a great rule of thumb is never touch the keyboard. If you're able to interact with somebody's screen or interact with their keyboard, I would just suggest avoiding it. Um, and, and here's an example of this, right? So if let's say this small Python program and you're looking at it and you're just saying, this is, they've gotten the right code, but it could be so much better. If they just said, you know, if my number is in this list of special numbers, it would work so much easier. And if you give into that temptation to just sort of edit their code, what happens is that they'll look at their code and it won't be their code anymore. They won't understand what they've written. They won't understand what, what you've been thinking. And I've often had a situation where I'll have a student come into a consultation and they'll say, here's a piece of code that my tutor helped me with and I really don't understand it. And, and often I think a, a, a cause of that is when a student has had part of the code written for them or, or, or dictated to them it, without expl explanation and they really don't understand what's going on. So yeah, tip six, never touch the keyboard. Tip seven, don't teach alone. Um, so I realize that you know not everyone is in the same position where they have this luxury of being able to, to go and find uh, lots of other people to watch them teach. Um, but where possible, I would suggest watching how other people teach. So, you know, if you can find uh, different presentations online or different ways of explaining the same topic, what you're going to do over time is you'll see the different ways in which people uh, present something. Uh, you, you can keep an eye on their style. As well as that, what you'll often find is that you can, um, when you're getting taught something, you can have in the back of your mind, you know, like, how is this person trying to teach me this thing? How are they doing it? And that, again, can be super handy because if you're watching them and trying to understand, you know, what are they trying to teach me and how are they doing it? That's a really good way of, of, of understanding, um, uh, of, of seeing teaching styles and seeing, you know, is this good or is this not good? Um, practically though, the other reason why it's really useful to not teach alone is because if a student doesn't understand you, you can bring somebody else across. Uh, you can, you know, somebody might have a different style. And I uh, sometimes students get really worried when, or sometimes new tutors, I should say, get really worried when they're like, the student, I've been sitting with them for 10 minutes, they don't understand what I'm saying. Often it's just that, you know, maybe you have a slightly different teaching style, or maybe you use different analogies and it doesn't quite click with them. So having a second person there can be really handy because it means somebody else is, is there to um, sort of co uh, collaborate with you and jump in and give them a break. And even that like short break, even if you're the only person there is amazing because if there's a short break there, you can change your style. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so being able to change your style in a short break like I just did there um, can be amazing because it gives you uh, a distance from your previous explanation and now you go to a new explanation and maybe that helps better. So even if you're the only teacher there, I can still recommend you know, take a break or even if there's like another person there, Maybe get them in and, and, and see if having another person who could, that you can work with or a more experienced student who maybe understands the content already, bring them in to just play around it and see if having another person there will help. So yeah, tip seven, find other people to learn from and to teach with. Cool. Tip eight, dealing with particular types of students. This is a bit of a big tip. 
Um, whenever you're teaching more than one person, you'll almost always have a spectrum. So that's from students who are struggling, who maybe missed previous content, who, uh, you know, maybe they've got other things going in on their, in their lives. And then the other end of the spectrum is, you know, you've got really fast students who are working uh, way ahead of the content. Maybe they've already learned programming. And it can be really difficult to run a class of even a few people if there's this sort of spectrum. The, the thing that we generally point our tutors at is this sort of one third rule. So you can't teach everyone at once. So try and aim for a third of people thinking it's too fast. That's generally a good balance between most of the class being able to follow and being able to learn uh, and being engaged. Maybe there's one or two people at the bottom of the spectrum who you need to, oops, sorry, who you need to um, uh, catch up later. Or maybe there's a few people at the top of the spectrum who you need to um, uh, sort of give extra work to, but that's generally a good middle spot. When you're dealing with those struggling students, I suggest you know some patience, of course, giving them tasks to do and coming back to them later is often also a useful trick. So if you have spent a while with a single student or you've spent a while with a group of students, give them something simple to do so that they can sort of have a break from your explanation and then come back to them later. And of course, remember, remember psychological safety. For faster students, um, we have this concept called speed bumps. And that's the idea of a, um, a tool uh, to, you know, a really complicated problem that gets them engaged in something and means that they're not going to be sort of um, just uh, holding up the rest of the class with their sort of interesting question that's way ahead of the class. The other thing you can do as well is get them to help. Now, of course, some students might not have the, the skills that you, they need to help another student, but often if you pair people up together, the fast students can be useful to those slower students or, or, or to the struggling students. So yeah, tip eight, uh, any group of people will form this sort of continuum, have strategies to deal with all of them and, and see if you can sort of target that a little bit below the middle. Um, cool. Tip number nine, uh, dealing with imposter syndrome. So what is imposter syndrome? It's this idea of you're, you're not feeling um, uh, confident or, or, or capable of, of doing this job of teaching people. Uh, and I know it's something that almost every tutor uh, struggles with at some point. And there are two tips that I've got, two sub tips here that I've got, which can help kind of combat it. The first one is to think that even if you're not the best at this particular subject, often there's a student in your class who's been doing it for years and you're like, oh my goodness, this student is way better than me. Teaching is a separate skill and it's a skill that's you know just as relevant and valid. And so maybe you're not the best at this particular coding topic, but you've still got the skill of communicating it to other people. And so if you think about your skills in that way, sometimes that can help with the thought of, you know, like, oh, I'm not good enough because there's one person knows how to code better than me. The other thing is to think, even if still you're not the best person in the room, you have a set of unique experiences and a perspective that people might find useful. So it's really important to think about, okay, even if somebody else could program better than me and can teach better than me, there are some people in this room who have a shared experience. Maybe they're gamers and they love um, Mario and you can use Mario themed examples. Or maybe um, you know they come from a uh, the same background as you. So you have some sort of context there that you can share. So. Everybody, I think, is has a unique experience that makes them a, a good teacher in their own way. And so I often think that remembering those things can be useful uh, for, for dealing with that imposter syndrome. So yeah, you have unique experiences, and that's why you're a teacher. Um, my final tip, uh, sometimes it's better not to know. So uh, a really common question that I get from, from newer tutors is like, what do I do if I don't know the answer to something? And that can be scary. It's really scary to be standing in front of a class and have a student ask you something that you don't know the answer to. But if you don't know something, counterintuitively, that's actually a good thing because most of the work of being a computer scientist, of being a person who codes, is finding out the answer to a question that you don't know. So what you can do is you can say, I don't know. This is a great question. And so next, what you've got to do is show them how to find out. You know, Go on Google, go on Stack Overflow, uh, often we'll get people to open up a text editor and actually write a program to try and answer the question. And so making these mistakes or not knowing something is really a good thing. It means that you're um, you're showing somebody a skill, the skill of how to learn. And it also kind of helps because it shows that you're not perfect. You know, it can often look like a person who's been programming for a while is just on some different level and it's an unachievable level of perfection in their programming. But the secret is, Everyone, you know, learned how to program and everyone has their own challenges in, in writing code. So showing that off and, and making that okay 
is sometimes a, is a good thing. And it definitely contributes to psychological safety as well. Um, so yep, uh, tip number 10, the last tip is it's okay not to know something, show people how you would find it out. Um, so that's the 10 tips. I'm sure that there's uh, things that you tell your, your students or you tell other people who are teaching that I've missed here. So I'm really curious to know what people think uh, I've missed, what other questions there are, if there's any other discussion, I'll be really keen for that. Um, but that's the end of the talk. Hello, fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I wasn't sure we were going to get through all 10, but we did. <laughs> that was great. <sighs> Whew, indeed. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions and we've got a couple of minutes, so it'll totally work out and then they'll Excellent. be dancing as promised. Um, uh, the first question, here we go. Um, Stack Overflow lacks psychological safety. Indeed it does. Uh, what would you do to help fix that? Ooh, this is an interesting question. I, um, I love I love that it is like outside the, the, the talk, but like so relevant. It's absolutely relevant. Um, Look, I'll be honest, I think part of the issue and part of the way that, that UNSW fixes this is that we have our own forums. Um, and I understand that, you know, fixing Stack Overflow is going to be a big task. So having safer spaces where students can feel confident to ask those questions um, is a really good thing. And also teaching those students good practice in terms of how do you, how are you respectful online? How are you teaching other people well? Um, that's definitely something I, I would focus on. And then you can sort of transition to linking those students to external resources that are good examples of being sort of psychologically safe. And hopefully that means that over time, those students have seen some of that Stack Overflow stuff without being exposed to the worst of it. Um, in terms of fixing a platform as big as Stack Overflow, I think that there's you know there's a large sort of societal change and, and, and changes to the platform that almost certainly need be needed to cause that big of a shift in how it works. But I think for our students, there are definitely things that we can do to make them feel safe, even when they're going onto those platforms, or to create experiences that avoid them going onto those platforms. I, I guess that actually leads us into this second question. Uh, we may have time for a third one afterwards. How do you encourage psychological safety in your course if students want to ask a question? Um, that's a that's a that's a great question. One of the examples that I removed from the talk, which I can bring up now, is often trying to avoid asking a single person something is a really great way of making people feel safer to answer questions. So uh, one thing that we especially use a lot now that we're online is polls. So if you sort of ask a question and then you know everybody can answer together, it's a lot less scary to click a button and and and, and fill in a poll than it is to answer a question and put your hand up and and possibly be wrong. The other thing as well, which uh, I talked to some of our new tutors about, is this idea of contribution being kind of like a battery where you need to recharge effectively. So students, they come in, they don't really want to contribute. They can do small things like, you know, filling in a poll. And as the lesson goes on, if they're having fun and if they're feeling safe, they'll feel more likely to be able to you know, put their hand up or contribute something bigger. So conserving that battery and thinking about, you know, structuring things in a way that it doesn't use up too much of it and that you're creating experiences where people feel safe and are recharged to contribute again, those are both things that I would be thinking about. Yeah, there are so many things to balance here, making sure that everyone is actually engaged and welcome and feels able to contribute and safe to contribute at the same, yeah. Gosh, yeah. it's, 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 it's hard. a big challenge. Teaching is teaching, hard. Teaching is difficult, man. Who would have almost, thought? <laughs> almost like we should have a whole track about it at PyCon. Oh, almost, almost. Uh, there are, uh, there's another question and I'm sure people mm -hmm. have more questions, but we are at time. So I'm going to throw this question over to the hallway track and invite you and you lot uh, on the stream to jump over there as well. Um, and up next is me and Amanda. And we're going to be talking about the education showcase, the student showcase. And I am very excited about that. So Tom, thank you so much. Um, uh, we will chat more in the hallway track. Uh, yep. And I hope you'll all join us to see the, what these students have come up with this year. Thanks so much. Thank you.